Okay, today we are studying the book, The Song of Solomon. Only one day. We can't obviously go through it thoroughly, but we want to give you a foundation of understanding this book so that from that foundation, you will be able to be like a, a miner that knows what direction to dig and to find precious gems or metal as you dig, as you continue to look more and more into this book. The Song of Solomon was written by Solomon about his love relationship with his uh, true and perhaps only uh, true love. He had lots of women, but he only had one that he seemed to have fallen in love with. And this is his song about his most special love, his dove, and it is prophetic about Christ and his bride, the church. So you can read this and you can see uh, something about uh, marriage relationship in many of the verses. And uh, some of the things in the book are R-rated, okay, for marrieds only. So if there's some verses that... Uh, that you find in your mind you can't, uh, it's not easy for you to meditate on, then don't meditate on those couple of verses, okay? Uh, if you're not married, if you've had difficulties with your thoughts in this realm of, of sexual relationships. But while it can be taught from a marriage and family aspect, that class is over, and I hope you all passed, okay? So this is going to look at the book, The Song of Solomon, from a spiritual perspective of what it prophetically means when Solomon is talking to his bride. Solomon is a type of Christ speaking to his bride, the church. And then when the bride replies back, that is like the church replying to Christ. And while it's a book about a love relationship, it can teach us how to fall in love over and over, deeper and deeper, with our Lord Jesus Christ. And so it helps us to deepen our relationship with the Lord, and it also teaches us from that relationship with the Lord how we can have more effective ministry. Because our ministry is only the overflow of the life of Christ that comes out of us. If we are ministering just from a professional uh, perspective of this is rituals, I know how to put together a good message and preach with, with enthusiasm and uh, I, I can weave my words skillfully together and have the people enjoy the message. If it's only natural, it will only bring forth natural fruit. But we don't want our speaking or the acts that we do or the songs that we sing we don't want them to be just merely natural. We want them, above all, to be permeated with the presence of God, with the love of God and his anointing, motivating us and, and not only filling our hearts, but then being released out of our hearts. Because our Lord Jesus said, uh, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so anything that comes out out of us in ministry first depends on what comes into us and fills our heart. So we don't just want to be Sunday ministers where we live carnal lives, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then we're just going, oh no, I've got a song leader. Oh no, I've got to do something on Sunday. I better get spiritual real quick. And then you, you, you really pray before Sunday comes and, and you feel you know some anointing. No, God doesn't want us just to be uh, seeking him for ministry because that will bring a limited blessing. Christ wants us to seek him because he is more than worthy of it all. He should be the center of our heart, of our life, of the church. 
And we find keys in the Song of Solomon that teach us how to deepen our relationship with the Lord Jesus and from that have a greater outflow of ministry. Okay? So it's a book about Solomon and his bride. Now, the bride is referred to. She's given the name. Uh, let's read it in Song of Solomon, chapter 6, verse, verse 13. 6, verse, verse 13. Verse 13. Return, return, O Shulamite. Return, return, that we may look upon you. What would you see okay. in the Shulamite? That's enough. Okay. Here we read that she's given the name Shulamite. Now, this is not obvious in English, but Shulamite is the feminine of Solomon. So maybe you hear people, uh, if they're talking about the book, The Song of Solomon, and they're talking about the bride, maybe they refer you to her name, the Shulamite. But Shulamite actually is the feminine of Solomon, and we might call her Mrs. Solomon, okay? The feminine Solomon, Mrs. Solomon. So this book is about Solomon and the woman he falls in love with who becomes Mrs. Solomon, his bride. Now, how many of you have translations that take the book, The Song of Solomon, and give you uh, subtitles before the different sections that explain who is speaking in the different parts. Like my new King James, right after the beginning, the Song of Songs, which is Solomon's. Then there is a subtitle in my Bible that says, the Shulamite. And then the next verses talk uh, two to four about what the Shulamite says. Then it says, the daughters of Jerusalem. Then later it talks about the beloved. That's Solomon speaking. How many of you, raise your hand. Do you have translations that explain who is speaking at the different sections of this? Okay, then I assume the rest of you either don't have your Bible, and I hope you've all got your Bible, or your Bible just gives it direct without explaining who is speaking. I have homework for each of you tonight. I want you to read the complete book, The Song of Solomon, tonight, and I want you to read it with a translation that puts into the different parts who is speaking at the different times. Now, most of the different people speaking can clearly be seen here in this book, first of all, from the original Hebrew language it was written in. Some parts, the person speaking is singular feminine. So if it's one woman speaking, then that very strongly suggests it's the bride talking at that point. If it is a singular one man, because the, the way the Hebrew is, like in English we have he and she, now in Tagalog, it's common for you to call uh, the man she and call the woman he because uh, you're not so used to those differences in language. But in Hebrew, it's very clear that there are times a single man is speaking or a single woman or a number of men are speaking or a number of women. And so Bible translators will often put into the translation if it's a single woman speaking, that it is the Shulamite. It's Mrs. Solomon speaking. Or if it is an, a, fe, a feminine plural speaking, like it says, we will run after you, that we feminine, they title it the daughters of Jerusalem because the daughters of Jerusalem are mentioned later in the book. So here is the special woman and her companions, the daughters of Jerusalem. Now, the beloved is singular, but if it's men in plural, then it's sometimes interpreted or said the brothers of the Shulamite. 
And so much of the time, this can be understood from the Hebrew. And since none of us are Hebrew scholars, we need to find someone who is. Read a translation that puts the different speakers in the different verses. Now, occasionally, the translators don't have the clue of the Hebrew, masculine, feminine, single, or plural. Sometimes they just look at the context and see, oh, well, from the way they're speaking, it's clearly not the, the bridegroom, it's not Solomon speaking. And so sometimes they put the name in from their investigating who it seems like is speaking. So if you read different translations that explain where the different people are speaking, occasionally there will be slight differences because that's not uh, always super clear in the original, but almost all the time, the translators will agree, oh, this is the bridegroom speaking, this is the bride, or my translation says the Shulamite, or well, these women are the daughters of Jerusalem. So it's good for you to read the different parts, or you can get very confused. So read a translation that puts the different people speaking in the different parts. Okay, so everybody got that? That's your homework assignment for tonight. Now let's look in our notes and let's consider the outline. Or no, first in your notes, it's, we read about how Solomon is a prophetic type, a prophetic picture of Christ who is to come. And Jesus said he was the greater than Solomon. Let's read in Luke eleven thirty one. The queen of the south will rise up in the judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear wisdom of Solomon. And indeed, a greater than Solomon is here. So Jesus said he is greater than Solomon. But he's paralleling himself with being similar to Solomon, but greater. And so... What are some of the ways they are similar? Number one, Solomon built the temple of God in the Old Testament. You're all familiar with that. And in the New Testament, it is Christ who is building his church, the temple of the Holy Spirit. Let's read that in Ephesians 2, verse 20 through 22. Verse 20. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the, the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. You are being built together as living stones that the Spirit of God will dwell among us and it is Christ who is the master builder building his spiritual temple, the church, just as Solomon was in the Old Testament filled with the spirit of wisdom that he could build a glorious natural temple. So Solomon and Christ are similar in building the great glorious temple of God. Number two, Solomon was the son of David. He was one of the many sons, but he took the title, the son of David. Let's read in 2 Samuel 12, 24. Then David comforted Bathsheba, his wife, and went into her and lay with her. So she bore a son, and he called his name Solomon. Now the Lord loved him. Solomon was the son of David, but that was a title that Christ took also. Let's read in Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, the very beginning of the New Testament. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Okay, so here Jesus was titled the son of David. And even in the New Testament days, 
They were looking for the son of David to come, and Jesus was sometimes praised by his followers as the son of David, like on the day that he came in the triumphant entry into Jerusalem. So Solomon was the son of David. Jesus was a son or the son of David. Number three, Solomon, his name means peace. Solomon comes from shalom, which is the Hebrew word for peace. So Solomon was the king of peace. There was no warfare during the reign of Solomon. David before him, King David had many battles. And right after Solomon's death, there was warfare again. But all during Solomon's reign, there was peace. Let's read 1 Kings 4.21. So Solomon reigned over all kingdoms from the river to the land of the Philistines as far as the border of Egypt. They brought tribute and served Solomon all the days of his life. And 24 and 25 verses? Verse 24. For he had dominion over all the region on this side of the river from Tipsa and even to Gaza namely over all the kings on this side of the river. And he had peace on every side all around him. And Judah and Israel dwelt safely, each man under his vine and his fig tree, from Dan as far as Beersheba all the days of Solomon. There was peace in all of his kingdom. There was peace in all of his empire. David had to defend himself against enemies and in those battles, he built an empire from the Euphrates River down to Egypt. And that empire included all of or parts of 10 modern nations. David conquered the Middle East, and Solomon ruled the Middle East in peace. He was the king of peace even as his name means King Shalom, King Solomon. Now we know, of course, that Jesus is the Prince of Peace. And when he reigns for 1,000 years upon this present earth, the nations will, will take their weapons and beat their swords into plows to plow the ground and become farmers, and they will take their military equipment and melt them down and use the metal for peaceful purposes. There will be no war for the thousand years of Christ's kingdom until Satan is loosed at the very end. So Solomon, through his life, he had a kingdom of peace. When Christ rules the world for a thousand years, he will have a kingdom of peace. Okay, so in these important ways, Solomon was prophetic of the coming greater son of David, the greater than Solomon. Now, we can say, well, what about all of Solomon's immorality and idolatry and backsliding? Well, agreed, in the last part of his life, Solomon was not continuing as a prophetic type of Christ. He began well and ended up doing pretty lousy, pretty poorly. So he was an imperfect prophetic type because of his backsliding. But in his younger years, when he was a good and pure king, he shined forth the, the goodness of Christ and ruled a kingdom of righteousness peace and joy. And all the people sat under their vines and under their fig trees, and they were prosperous and they were happy, except for when he had them have big building projects as he became greater and greater and wanted more and more. The people ended up by the end of his life complaining that he made them work so hard to build such a glorious kingdom. But that was the we could say, the second half of his reign. In the first half of his reign, he was pure and he was godly. Let's look at a scripture in 1 Kings 3.3 3 that shows us 
the foundation of his life and of his reign. Second Kings, uh, no, it's, excuse me, it's probably First Kings 3.3. 3. First Kings 3, verse 3, sir. First Kings. And, so and Solomon loved the Lord, walking in the statutes of his father David, except that he sacrificed and burned incense at the high places. This was speaking of the beginning of his kingship. He loved the Lord. He walked in the statutes or in the laws of his father David. David had put righteous laws upon the nation, and most of his lifetime, David lived righteously. And Solomon lived according to the good example and good laws of David that honored the Lord. So he loved God, he walked in righteousness, and then you read the rest of the chapter, the Lord came to him as a new king and said, what would you like? How can I bless you now that you're a king? And Solomon said, Lord, please give me wisdom. So Solomon had a very good beginning to his kingship. He didn't have a good middle and end, but he wrote, the Song of Solomon in his early years before he really backslid. Now, how do we know exactly when he wrote the Song of Solomon? We don't know the exact year, but we have a clue in Song of Solomon. I think it's chapter 6, 11. Let me see. No. Okay, where does it talk about his brides? 60 brides. Does anyone know where that scripture is in the Song of Solomon? 60 brides, many concubines, only one, my love. What is it? 6, 8. Okay, I thought 6, 11. Okay. Yep, okay. If you look in Song of Solomon, chapter uh, 6, verse 8 and 9, let's read that. There are 60 queens and 80 concubines and virgins without number. My dove, my perfect one, is the only one, the only one of her mother, the favorite of the one who bore her. The daughters saw her and called her blessed the queens and the concubines, and they praised her. Okay, now in our modern Christian mind, it could be a little difficult for us to say, okay, Solomon's got 60 queens and 80 concubines, okay, and he has one love relationship with one special bride. Is he pure? Well, it was legal in the Old Testament to have many wives. And if you remember, he ended up having a thousand. Ay, ay, ay. So here, he only had, he started at this point when he wrote the Song of Solomon, he had 140 wives and concubines. <laughs> Sobra na, okay? But if you compare that with how many he ended up with, a thousand, this was only about, what, a sixth or a seventh? of his eventual wives. So this was still early in his reign. And when he began as king, many of his marriages were with the daughters of the kingdoms around him because in those ancient days, the way that nations often made a bond of peace between the nations was to have the royalty from each nation marry each other. So... If a king wanted to have peace with a neighboring kingdom, he would marry a daughter of that king. And through the royal marriages, they are making it a peace treaty. They are making it an alliance between the nations. So a lot of the first wives of Solomon were not anything to do with how beautiful the lady was. It was merely that they were from 
royalty from around the Middle East, and they became Solomon's wives in a peace treaty, in a commitment between the kingdoms. So a lot of those first brides, it wasn't anything at all to do with love. So we find Solomon saying, early in his reign, after he collected wives from all of the neighboring kingdoms to bring peace, and he still only had one-sixth or one-seventh of his eventual wives, he ended up falling in love with one special lady who it wasn't an arranged marriage. It wasn't of royalty. She wasn't from a very rich family that wanted uh, an alliance with Solomon. She had been a simple country girl. Okay, she was a barrio girl out from the countryside. She had been a, a, a keeper of vineyards. She had sheep. She was a farm girl that Solomon in his travels met and wooed and fell in love with. And all of the rest, we don't know if he had developed any kind of a, 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 you know, of a period of courting. When he was the king, he could just go around and say, I'll take that one, I'll take that one. Ay, 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 okay. But here, in the Song of Solomon, he had found one special country girl that he thought was the most special of all that he developed a lovely love relationship with. So uh, tune out as New Testament Christians. Tune out that he had many wives, okay? But just remember, this was his one great love relationship in life. Not an arranged marriage, which most of the others were. Not just based on who's the cutest girl, okay? No, this was someone that he saw, that he became friends with, and eventually married. Now, we read about the developing relationship that they had in the outline of the book, so in your notes, you have an outline. Part number one of the book, from chapter one, verse one, through chapter three, verse five, talks about Solomon and the bride falling in love. They met each other out in the countryside. They fell in love. And then they ended up getting married and starting in Song of Solomon chapter 3, verse 6, it talks about their wedding time. So let's read about Solomon's glorious entrance on his wedding day in Song of Solomon 3, verse uh, 6 through 11. Verse 6. Who is this coming out of the wilderness like pillars of smoke, perfumed with myrrh and frankincense, with all the merchant's fragrant powders? Behold, it is Solomon's couch with 60 valiant men around it. Okay, of the uh, of excuse me. Well, first, Solomon's couch. We, in modern uh, uh, scientific terminology, call that a palanquin. I don't know if you have that term in Tagalog. It's where uh, servants will carry a chair, okay? And as the chair is being carried around, the person on top is either rich or they are of royalty. So here we find a procession coming out of the wilderness with smoke, maybe incense, and maybe the dust of these 60 of the mightiest soldiers of Solomon carrying this palanquin. Uh, if you've ever been to Brunei, they have a royal museum there, and they have the king's palanquin. They have his royal chariot, and there will be, I don't remember if it's uh, 20 or 30 uh, mighty soldiers 
that will carry this palanquin around, but it's modern days. There are secret tires underneath, okay? And his, his chair on top actually has air conditioning vents blowing on him. So while he's looking, it looks like he's being carried down the street, he's got air conditioning, and the soldiers don't have a hard time because it's, it's on wheels. But here we find the beginning of this wedding procession, 60 of the mightiest soldiers of Israel carrying this great, on poles, this great royal throne that Solomon sat on. So let's start reading again the beginning of verse 7. Verse 7, Behold, it is Solomon's couch with 60 valiant men around it of the valiant of Israel. Verse 8, They all hold swords, being expert in war, Every man has his sword on his thigh because of fear in the, in the night. Of the wood of Lebanon, Solomon the king made himself a palanquin. He made its pillars of silver, its support of gold, its seat of purple, its interior paved with love by the daughters of Jerusalem. Go forth, O daughters of Zion, and see King Solomon with the crown with which his mother crowned him on the day of his wedding, the day of the gladness of his heart. Okay, so this is talking about the day of his wedding. And his mother had put a crown upon him, and he was being carried by the valiant soldiers of procession. He had a palanquin made out of uh, silver and gold and embroidery, embroidery work of the daughters of Jerusalem. So he came up in royal procession to go see the bride. And the next couple of chapters talk about the wedding day. And then after the wedding day, then we find starting in chapter 5, verse 2, we find about after they're married, how they continued to develop their love relationship. So we have titled that Growing in love. Okay, three sections. Falling in love, the wedding day, and then after they were married, how they grew in love and service together as they ended up uh, going out to the, to the vineyards and uh, looking at the fruitful fruit trees. And uh, it speaks about ministry for us going out with the Lord to the vineyard of the Lord, to, the, to go out to the people and to the churches. But these are the three basic parts. So as you're reading this book tomorrow, start by looking at this first section up to chapter 3, verse 5, and it's talking about the falling in love of this young peasant girl from the countryside with Solomon, and then it's talking about the royal procession of Solomon coming up, and they're professing their love to each other, and then their uh, wedding night spoken of figuratively in, in the end of this part of the wedding day. And then after that, it talks about what they did in the many days and weeks afterwards as they were developing their relationship together. Now, in our notes, look at your notes near the top on the section that says, Three Stages of Maturing Relationship. Thumbs up. Do you all see that in your notes? Three Stages of Maturing Relationship. Now, we all know that there's, uh, God often works in three stages of spiritual level. There's the outer court of Moses' tabernacle, the holy place, holy of holies. We find in the feasts of Israel, there were three groups of feasts. God had Moses institute, Passover, Pentecost, and tabernacles. Tabernacles being the great feast, even spoken of in, in the Gospel of John as the great feast. So progression and development in the tabernacle of Moses in the feasts of Israel, in the journey of Israel. They went from the Egypt into the wilderness 
up to the promised land, three stages of journey. But in the Song of Solomon, we see these three steps or these three stages, not in a journey like Israel, not in a building like the tabernacle of Moses, but we see these three steps of development in terms of the growing love relationship of the bride with her king. So let's first read Song of Solomon, chapter 216. And as they were developing their relationship, let's see what kind of relationship the Shulamite had with her future husband. Chapter 2, verse 16. My beloved is mine, and I am his. He feeds his flock among the lilies. Okay, here she says, My beloved is mine, and I am his. But the first part is, she had a love that was receiving, that was taking. Oh, I, uh, I, I get your love, and you get mine. But the first part, the predominant, the preeminent part here, spoken of first, is that she said, he is mine. It's taking. And then, and I am his, it's giving. Now, did Jesus say it's more blessed to take or to give? Is it more blessed to receive or more blessed to give? What did Paul quote of the words of Jesus in the book of Acts? It's more blessed to give than to receive. Okay? But here, at the beginning of her relationship, she said, oh, my blessing is, look what I get. And, and, he, and I give myself too. Okay? But it is, we could say, a more selfish or self-centered love. Because the first thing she's thinking about is the man she gets. This great loving one, this king who professes his sweet love to her. And so she's looking at what she gets and she will give. So it's a give and take, but for her it's mostly a take at first, okay? It's more of a self-centered or selfish love. And when we are first born again, oh, it's so easy to love the Lord and say, oh, Jesus is my Savior. Oh, he fills me with his love. He gives me peace and joy. He forgave my sins. I have eternal life. Oh, Jesus is my Savior. Look at all the things I get. And he's my Lord, Kung Min Sang, okay? Sometimes I remember he's supposed to be Lord and Savior. But when you're first born again, it's the Savior part that you're thinking about all the blessings, the love, the joy. And that is fine in an immature love relationship. To just see all of the blessings. Oh, he loves me. Oh, do you know what he said? Do you know the sweet text he sent? Oh, he gave me flowers. Oh, chocolate for Valentine's Day? Oh, okay. Now, don't get too excited, ladies. Uh, stay spiritual as we're trying to uh, go through this book, okay? But you get the idea, okay? The first expression of love here is that she gets his love and gives her own. But after the love relationship develops, after they're married, let's read in Song of Solomon 6.3 what she says there about their relationship. I am my beloved, and my beloved is mine. He feeds his flock among the lilies. Okay, this time, she does not say, my beloved is mine, as the first and most important thing. No, the first and most important thing had developed so that she said, I am my beloved's, and he is mine. Do you see? Baliktad ito? 
This is the opposite of the first developing love that she had. At first, she was more concerned with receiving love and giving some. But now her love was developing that the most important thing was giving her love and receiving in return. It's more blessed to give than to receive. Now, it's blessed to receive. Okay, don't you all like a gift? Okay. We all, it's, it's blessed to receive. So when she first said, my beloved is mine, look at what I get. That's a blessing. That's the beginning of love. But love in its nature is more than just selfishly what you get. The highest love is what you give. No one has greater love than this that he will lay down his life. And so if we lay down our life for our marriage partner, that is an expression of love. It shows your care. It shows that the other is first and foremost. So maybe some of you have seen the, the play based on uh, a Jewish family where this husband and wife have lived together for many years, and it was an arranged marriage at first. There was no love at first, but after maybe 30 years, the husband says, do you love me? Have any of you ever seen Fiddler on the Roof? Okay, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty nice, uh, pretty pure uh, musical from years ago back when they used to be cleaner and nicer things, okay? Uh, and her reply was, for, you know, for 35 years, I've washed your food, I've, I've washed your clothes, I've cooked your food, I've had your children, do I love you? You know, she's saying, I've demonstrated my love. I have given you all of my life, all of my strength, you know? And that to her was the proof that she had truly developed in a relationship, a giving relationship of love. Okay, if you haven't seen Fiddler on the Roof, scratch that illustration. But we see here she is developing in her love relationship from a selfish taking love to a selfless giving love as the most important part. She said... I am my beloved, and he is mine. So giving and taking, the opposite of it first, which was taking and giving. But let's look by the end of the book of Song of Solomon at the development of her love relationship in Song of Solomon chapter 7, verse 10. I am my beloved's, and his desire is toward me. Here she says, I am my beloved's. I give myself my love to him, and he desires me. She doesn't say anything about what she'll get out of the relationship anymore. That's no longer important to her. What's important to her is what she is giving in this love relationship. That is her joy. That is her uh, mature expression of love, that she is fully giving her love and it is motivating her husband to deeply love her. So we see here a development in her relationship of love. It started out a selfish love on what she got out of the relationship, and a new baby Christian, what do babies want? They want more food. Wah, wah, wah. They need their diaper changed. Wah, wah, wah. And a baby thinks the whole world exists to serve him. Mom and dad are the servants, and the baby is the center of the universe, okay? Everything lives for the baby's needs. Cry and help will come. 
A baby is selfish. As a baby grows up, he has to learn that everybody doesn't do everything for him. The baby grows up and is six years old, and the mother says, now you're going to start taking out the garbage, or now you're going to start washing your own clothes, or now you're, you're nine years old, now you're going to learn how to start cooking the food. And you get a giving relationship developing, that not everything is given to you in life, but you learn in life to give. And so in the natural, there's a development from selfish living as a baby into maturing giving of our life. But then the fullness of this relationship, she says, I am my beloved's and he desires my love. And that is a sacrificial giving love. Not looking for anything in return. Just being overjoyed by giving joy to her beloved. Her joy is found in him. Not in what she gets from him. Her joy is found in him. And so that's why we sing songs like, I seek the giver, not the gift. That we don't just want to, you know, serve God because he blesses us. But we serve God purely because we love him. He's worthy. And he desires our love, our service. So there is a development of love that can take place in a person's uh, maturing or in a marriage relationship and for us as we grow to become part of the maturing bride of Christ that is no longer just mainly looking for what we get from God in our relationship, but what we can give to the Lord, how we can be a greater blessing and be a greater joy and delight to the heart of God. This is what God made us for, that we will have a giving love. Let's read in 1 John 2.14. First John 2, verse 14. I have written to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I have written to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the wicked one. Okay, when it talks about uh, uh, a, a baby in Christ there, or a little child, it talks about how they know God is a father, but here... A maturing person knows him so much deeper. You have known the eternal one. That's a lot deeper than just to know you have a mom or a dad. A little baby can know they have a mom or a dad, but they don't know much about them. But by the time you become 30 or 40 years old and you have children, you will understand your mom and your dad a lot better. And you'll understand why they did the things they did in life. So as we mature, we come to know God in a deeper way. And we come to know his giving heart. We get a glimpse again of that in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 14 and 15. Uh, 1 Corinthians or 2 Corinthians? 2 Corinthians, I think. Yeah. Second Corinthians 12, verses 14 to 15. Now for the third time, I am ready to come to you, and I will not be burdensome to, to you. For I do not seek yours, but you. For the children ought not to lay up for the parents, but the parents for the children. And I will very gladly spend and be spent for your souls. Though the more abundantly I love you, the less I am loved. So Paul here was speaking to the Corinthians. Some of them were turning away from him, even though he had sacrificed, spent several years starting the church, building the church up strong, 
And then after that, some are going off and saying, well, I am of Apollos. Well, I'm not of Paul or Apollos. I just follow Jesus. And there were people that were turning cold towards his ministry. But he said, I'm coming back. I'm coming back as a father who will give even if my love is not fully returned. A giving love of a mature father or mother is like the heart of God. You give whether it's received or not. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Some received him, but to his, he came to his own, and his own received him not. But a sacrificial giving love is the maturing of our character. Whether as a maturing mom or dad or as a maturing in our marriage. And what we want to emphasize is a maturing in our spiritual life with Christ, our heavenly bridegroom. So the book of the Song of Solomon is to teach us about how to develop into mature, pure love with the Lord, since we're not going to look at this from a marriage and family viewpoint. How can we develop a very mature, giving love that will be the joy of our God and will be our joy also? Well, we read that in the Song of Solomon. Now, do you remember in, when we studied the book of Ecclesiastes, what was Solomon's message there at the very beginning? Vanity of vanities. All is vanity. Everything is empty and useless. But many years before, when he was still a pure king and he had a pure love relationship, he wrote the beginning of his book, The Song of Songs. So Solomon has a lot to teach us, whether it's the love song above all love songs or whether it's the vanity of vanities, the discouragement of all discouragements. Okay, he was on the top and he was on the bottom. But right now we'll be studying when he was on the top in his relationship with God and with his very special bride. Let's have a 10-minute break, and we'll get more. We'll dig more into this book together. Thank you. God bless. Now let's go down in our notes to the next section we have that says, a maturing Christian will have a changing testimony. Okay? When we're saved, we say, Jesus is my Savior. Jesus gives me love. It's a selfish relationship. And our own perspective in it is that of a spiritual baby. But the relationship will change us as we will grow in God. So let's start out by looking at the, let's read uh, verse 1 and 2 and <clears throat> verse 5 and 6. Verse 1 and 2, the song of songs, which is Solomon's, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for your love is better than wine. Verse 5 and 6, I am dark but lovely, O daughters of Jerusalem, like the tents of Kedar, like the curtains of Solomon. Do not look upon me because I am dark, because the sun has tanned me. My mother's son were, sons were angry with me. They made me the keeper of the vineyards, but my own vineyard I have not kept. So the beginning, Solomon just says, this is the song of songs. Now we all know that uh, out of all the songs in the world, songs about revolution, songs about 
justice, songs about the beauty of nature, that the most common and most uh, expressive songs, what you'll find, if, if there's like a top 10 songs, you'll find most of them are love songs. Okay, love is the strongest motive and is the highest aim seen in mankind. And so this song of songs is the greatest of love songs. And so it t starts out talking about how the uh, beloved's love is better than wine, that he is such a, a desirable uh, partner in life. But after giving just an introduction that this is about love and their relationship, then she starts out the Shulamite, starts talking about what she was like when she first met Solomon. So let's read that again in verse 5 and 6. The Shulamite, I am dark but lovely, O daughters of Jerusalem, like the tents of Kedar, like the curtains of Solomon. Do not look upon me because I am dark, because the sun has tanned me. My mother's sons were angry with me. They made me the keeper of the vineyards, but my own vineyard I have not kept. Okay, and then verse 7. To her beloved, tell me, O you whom I love, where you feed your flock, where you make it rest at noon. For why should I be as one who veils herself by the flocks of your companions? So here she is talking about herself when she was a country girl and she had uh, heard about Solomon, maybe seen him travel by, uh, maybe on his travels he would go by and she would see him and had already started to uh, admire and love the king. But here in the first speaking that they have together, she says, I am dark but lovely, like the tents of Kedar, like the curtains of Solomon. Now these are two opposites, and many times in Jewish poetry, the same thing will be said twice with slightly different words. Uh, so here we read that she is dark but lovely. Those are opposites, okay? Dark being referring to the color of her skin. She had very dark skin because she worked outside so much that the sun had burned her and she was very black. And so she was ashamed of how dark she looked. But she was lovely. She had both of these at the same time. Do you ever think of yourself, well, I'm pretty good. Well, I'm really not good at all, okay? Or ladies, maybe you look in the mirror, I'm pretty, I'm pretty, pretty, but oh, look at that, a pimple, aye, aye, okay? And, and so there are times that, that we see both at the same, the good and the bad, the lovely, but the ugly. And then she says, let's like the tents of Kedar, Kedar were the Ishmaelites, and we'll read about, study about that. They were the sons of the flesh. Let's read in Genesis. Uh, okay, no, I don't have a scripture about that. Kedar, they came from, uh, from Esau. They came from the sons of the flesh, and they were different than Solomon, who came from the godly line of the Jews. But the tents of Kedar, they lived in tents, and it was common in those days, the most common tent was made out of black goat's hair. So when she said, I'm dark but lovely, she's saying, I am black like the tents of Kedar, but I am beautiful like the curtains 
of Solomon. And when you read about the curtains Solomon made in his temple, they were white, they were embroidered, they were glorious. So she's saying, I'm black like the tents of Kedar, but I'm beautiful like the white embroidered curtains of Solomon. She was both at the same time. And this is what happens to us when we are young Christians. We struggle with the ugliness of our old Adamic nature while at the same time appreciating the beauty of the nature of Christ that is growing within us. But we have a struggle, the old and the new, the Adamic and the Christ-likeness in our lives. And even the Apostle Paul wrote about this struggle. Let's read in Romans 7, 19. Verse 19. For the good that I will to do, I do not do. But the evil I will not to do, that I practice. So he wanted to do good, but instead he followed the evil that he didn't want to do. There was the struggle between the old nature, sinful nature of Adam, and the desire for purity of the nature of Christ. And let's read more in Romans 8.13. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. So again, there is death following the works of the flesh, a life of sin, of the old nature. But as that's put to death, as we know that we are crucified with Christ, as we live a new life as a Christian, there is beauty, there is glory that is growing in our life. But a young Christian has a lot of up days, a lot of down days. Up, oh, I love Jesus, and, and I just told someone about the Lord, and, and I, just, I just showed the love of God. And then the next day, oh, I'm in bondage to my old sin. Oh, I'm struggling. I can't control my mind. The darkness, the blackness of the old and the beauty of the new. So when the Shulamite first met Solomon, her confession was, I'm lovely I'm beautiful, but I'm black. I'm, I'm ashamed. I, uh, my father's sons, uh, my brothers were angry at me. They made me work so hard in the vineyard. I've had the sun make me so dark. I, 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 I feel black. And yet, there was still beauty within her. Okay? And so, that's how a young Christian can often feel, that struggle between the old and the new. We also see it prophetically in this story of Genesis 25, verse 22 and 23. If we could read that, please. Genesis 25, 22 to 23. But the children struggled together within her, and she said, If all is well, why am I like this? So she, she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb. Two peoples shall be separated from your body. One people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. Okay, so when Rebecca was pregnant, she found she had warfare within her womb. She had two sons that were fighting and kicking each other. And she wondered, what, what's this all about? All of these bumps and kicks and... And, and so she really sought the Lord. And the Lord said, you have two children that will become two nations. And they are going to struggle against each other in life. And even when they become nations, they will fight between themselves. And so there was Esau that became the Edomites, part of, uh, of uh, Jordan to this day that has had war with the Israelites who came from her other son, Jacob, who was renamed Israel. So 
Rebecca had within her Esau, a carnal man that became an enemy of God, and she had Jacob that became Israel, the prince of God. She had this struggle within her womb, but this is a struggle we have in our heart between the old nature and the nature of Christ, that of the flesh and that of the spirit. But she said the reason why she was so dark. Let's read that again in verse 6. Verse 6. Do not look upon me because I am dark, because the sun has tanned me. My mother's son were angry with me. They made me the keeper of the vineyards, but my own vineyard I have not kept. So here she's saying, my brothers made me work so hard out in the field. They made me the keeper of all the vineyards. I had to cut the vines. I had to screw away the foxes. I had to prune the branches. I had to pick the fruit. I had to, and the bugs, and, and it's hot, and the sun was hot, and I've just been sunburned. I'm so black. She said, they made me the keeper of the vineyards, but my own vineyard I have not kept. Now, let's read what a vineyard speaks of, spiritually speaking, in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 5. Let's start by reading verse 1. Verse 1. Uh, now let me sing to my well beloved a song of my beloved regarding his vineyard. My well beloved has a vineyard on a very fruitful hill. But that vineyard ended up bringing forth bad fruit. And so, Jesus, or the Lord, through Isaiah, gave this, this song, this parable, about Israel, the nation, that God planted and wanted to be like a fruitful vineyard, but they ended up backsliding with great evil and idolatry. They, they brought forth bad fruit. But read verse 7, please, just the first part. Isaiah 5, verse 7, first section. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. Okay, so here we get it clear. Israel was God's vineyard that he planted to bring forth fruit. And we find all through the scriptures that a vineyard can speak of groups of believers whether it's Israel or whether it's a church. Or Jesus said in John 15, I am the vine, you are the branches. Uh, you are to bring forth good fruit. It's talking about how we are to uh, be like a vine, part of a vineyard. And she said, my mother's sons were angry with me. They made me keep the vineyards. Spiritually speaking, it's not that they made her do natural work, but that her brothers in the Lord made her take care of all of these Christian ministries. They made me keeper of the vineyards. They made me the treasurer of the church and the secretary of the church, and I'm the song leader, and now they've just given me my third uh, Bible study in the week. I've got so many things to do. I have not kept the vineyard of my own heart. Now, this is a common experience in young Christians that are starting to serve the Lord. That if you're young and talented, you will have people offer to give you more and more things to do. Because pastors are very busy and they want a lot accomplished in their church. And so the ministers will say, uh, you're a song leader? Good. How about, you know, uh, you'll be a song leader and 
Uh, oh, you go to Bible school. Oh, well, why don't you, listen, we've got three Bible studies we need leaders for. How about if you do three Bible studies every week? And you get more and more responsibilities. How many of you, when you've started serving in a church, you get so many responsibilities, it takes up so much of your time, that you would say, they made me take care of the ministry of other things, but I have not ministered to my own spiritual life. I haven't kept my own vineyard fruitful. I've helped everybody else to grow in God, but I feel dry and empty. Has that ever happened to you? Hmm? Okay. A lot of hands. Some of you, maybe you're young, and your hands will go up in a couple of years. Okay. But most of you know what I'm talking about, that young Christians are zealous for God, and we want to prove that we're, we really love the Lord, and we really want to serve in church, and we really, you know, are preparing for ministry, so we just volunteer for everything under the sun. Or we have everything dumped on us, more and more responsibilities. They made me the keeper of the, I'm the church treasurer now. They made me the keeper of, oh, they needed someone to mop the floors. Okay. They made me the keeper of the, oh, the, the, the outreach over there. Okay. Okay, pastor. Yep. I'll take that responsibility. They made me in charge of uh, all of the, the tech team. Uh, I that's so hot, so, so long, but okay, I'll, okay, I'll do it. I'm taking care of all these things, but my own vineyard, my own garden in my heart is not being properly fruitful. When I graduated from Bible school, I went out to direct an evangelism center, and then I was invited to uh, uh, make a record album for free, there was someone that would pay the, the, the money f for the recording studio, which cost a fair amount, and make the record, and I could have my first Christian record, and someone else uh, offered that there was going to be a big crusade in the city of Detroit. I could be in charge of all of the prayer teams and go around to all of the churches and organize all of the prayer meetings for the coming crusade, and I would get to know so many new pastors and, and organize all the intercessors and, and, and become well-known in this great city. And uh, I had the offer to... Uh, I had so many things. I had a book full of a list of churches that I could just uh, uh, decide what church I wanted to preach in the next Sunday. And they would usually tell me to come because I was a good preacher. And all, in all these things, I got so busy serving the Lord that I did not keep a proper relationship with the Lord. And so... A prophet came to me one day and said, Brother Norman, I just had a vision of your life, and I saw you as a vessel of gold. God has made you to be a vessel of honor, a person of many talents. You're a vessel of gold, but I see that you are being filled with vanity. And that shocked me. I've got this ministry, I've got this ministry, I'm doing this, I'm blessing that, I'm doing it, and, and I'm becoming filled with vanity? No, I am, I am the servant of the Lord. Oh, but, but when I got alone and was honest before God, I saw, yes, I was getting so proud. I was so self-centered. And I wasn't praying very much anymore. When I read my Bible, it was just to get another message to preach. It wasn't to be devotionally fed. And I could say, like, the beginnings of this young woman, that I have been made the keeper of so many ministries, but I haven't kept my own heart fruitful and full of love. 
I was being filled with vanity. And so I got honest before God. Lord, what do you want me to do? And the Lord told me, resign everything. So I resigned from the, and, and of course I discussed it with leaders and with others that, that I had to work with, and, and they were gracious to let me uh, resign. I didn't take the money, didn't record the record album. I, 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 somebody else handled the prayer ministry. Uh, everything stopped, and I got a job as a night security guard at a factory where every hour I just walked around this huge factory once, made sure there was no fire anywhere, no robbers, and I go back to my booth, and they paid me. Ford Motor Company paid me that about eight hours every night. I worked 10 or 12 hours, but eight or 10 of those hours, I got to read my Bible and pray. They paid me to seek the Lord every night. Well, those are good jobs, okay? I just had to walk around a little, and then the rest of the time, I sat there, read my Bible, prayed, worshiped, sang as I went through the empty building, and slowly, my love relationship with the Lord was restored and deepened. But there are times when we have to balance out ministry responsibilities and First and foremost, the responsibility of keeping our own heart full of love, peace, joy, and fruitfulness to the Lord, that God is pleased, that we're not full of pride, and we're not full of, well, this and that, and, you know, that person there is not really helping in the ministry, and that person there is carnal, and, and I'm getting carnal too, and I'm, nope, we need to evaluate. Are we lovely in the sight of God? Or are we also burned and dark? Are we like the curtains of Solomon, beautiful tapestry in the house of God? Or are we the black tents of the carnal people of Kedar, the enemies of God? The mixture that can be in our life. So this was the first experience, spiritual experience of the coming bride. She struggled with the old nature of Adam and with the new nature of Christ. Okay? And, oh, yes, we have in your notes about the tents of Kedar. Let's read Genesis 25, verse 13 to see about that. Kedar were the Ishmaelites. Verse 13, and these were the names of the sons of Ishmael, by their names according to their generations. The firstborn of Ishmael, Nebajoth, then Kedar, Abdil, Mibsam. Okay, so Ishmael was the son of the flesh. There was Isaac, born of the spirit, and Ishmael, the mistake, the one born of the flesh from Abraham. And Ishmael had as one of his sons, Kedar, that became a tribe. And they lived in black tents out in the desert area. But they came from the Ishmael. And let's read in Galatians 4 about Ishmael, starting in verse 22. For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bond woman, the other by a free woman. Okay, so the free woman, that was Isaac, and the bond woman, the slave, the Egyptian, was Ishmael. Verse 23. But he who was of the bond woman was born according to the flesh, and he of the free woman through promise. Okay, so there was the one born of the flesh, and the one who was born with the spiritual promises of God, Isaac. But what about Ishmael? Let's read about uh, him in verse 29 through 31. But as he who was born according to the flesh then persecuted him, 
who was born according to the Spirit, even so it is now. Nevertheless, what does the Scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. We are of the spiritual lineage through Christ of Isaac. We inherit the promises of God. We are not the children of the flesh, doomed to destruction, but through Christ, we have the promise. We have the nature of Christ in us. But it says, but the one of the flesh persecuted the one born by the Spirit. The works of the flesh in us try to devour the work of the Spirit of God in bringing forth the fruit of the Spirit within us. And so we have to guard our vineyard. And that's what the Shulamite did. Let's turn back to the Song of Solomon. In chapter 2, verse 15, Verse 15, catch us the foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vines, for our vines have tender grapes. The vines, the vineyard, starts to grow tender grapes, but foxes are little animals that can come in and chew up and destroy the young grapes. And they, again, are spiritualized to mean for us, they are the works of the flesh that want to come into the vineyard of our heart and wants to destroy the fruit of the Spirit that is to grow as we are the branches of the vine. We are to grow fruit, but the works of the flesh want to try to spoil the fruit. And so the request here is catch the foxes. Get rid of the works of the flesh. Don't just be burned and carnal. Take care of your own vineyard. Take care of your own heart above all. Guard what is in your heart. For out of your heart spring the issues of life. So when this future bride first is seen here in the Song of Solomon, she is a farm girl, busy taking care of her brother's vineyards, but exhausted, tired, sunburned, discouraged, feeling ugly, not taking care of the garden of her own heart. Okay? So that's how the Song of Solomon starts. But let's go on and what does the bridegroom say about her in chapter 1, verse 15? Verse 15 of chapter 1. The beloved, behold, you are fair, my love. Behold, you are fair. You have dove's eyes. So here, she was discouraged with her darkness, with her being overly busy, and not taking care of herself. But the beloved said, you are fair. He didn't say, yeah, you know, you really got to work on that sunburn. You, you really, you know, pangitna. Pero, you know, maybe next year, if, if you use an umbrella out there, you know, maybe, maybe you'll have fair skin. No, he didn't say anything about the mixture in her life. He only said, you are fair, my love. You have dove's eyes. Now that, if you uh, don't know, doves can only look at and focus at one thing at a time. For America, for, for uh, I mean, for human beings, we call that tunnel vision. You only look at what's directly ahead of you, or you turn both of your eyes, and you only see what's over there or over there. Well, I'm looking right here at the screen, all the students, but I still see the brothers over here and the sisters behind them, and I see Kim over there. I have a wide field of vision. Doves 
have a narrow field of vision. Jesus said, if your eye is focused, if your eye is single, you will be full of light. But if your vision strays and you have some light and you look at darkness, this and that, then there will be darkness within you. So we need to learn how to focus our vision, our thoughts, on that which is pure, that which is lovely, that which is of good report, that our heart will be filled with light. And here she was commended that she had focused vision, that she was starting to set her heart on things above, not on the things of the earth. And while she was still dark, the beloved began to lift her up by his positive words. Now, do you remember when the apostle Peter first started following Christ? He was Simon the blunderer. He made many blunders, many mistakes. And when he, Christ did the miracle of the catch of the fish, uh, he said, depart from me, Lord, I'm a sinful man. He saw, I'm dark, I'm black. Lord, my life has been bad. But Christ looked at him and said, but you are fair. You are going to become a fisher of men. And Christ lifted him out of his discouragement. And so many times the Lord speaks to us graciously to lift us out of our discouragements to lift us out of our defeats. I was at a, uh, down in the island of Panay some years ago and was conducting a seminar in the province of Capiz. And we were praying for all of the people in this pastor's seminar at the end. And uh, I prayed over one brother, never met him, didn't know anything about him except that he came to a minister's seminar. But God gave me a prophecy that uh, you are like Gideon that was hiding from the enemy when he was threshing out the wheat in the wine press. Gideon was hiding there in that wine press. It was an a, a enclosed area where he could try to hide from the enemy so they wouldn't see he was gathering food. So in this prophecy, you are like Gideon hiding from the enemy. But the Lord says of you, you are a mighty man of valor and you will have victory and drive the enemy away. So I didn't know anything about the man. Afterwards, I asked the brother who was the local uh, organizer of the seminar, Pastor Ray Kalusai. I said, uh, Brother Ray, do you know anything about that man? Well, you know, was that prophecy okay? I didn't know anything about him. And uh, he told me, oh, uh, he is the district presbyter of the Assemblies of God in this province he has authority over all the churches. But just a few days ago, the NPA, the communist rebels, sent him a death threat that if he stayed at his church, they'd kill him. So here, and so Ray said, so he's, he's trying to decide, should he run away and hide or should he stay and be target practice for the NPA? And that's when we had the seminar, and the word of God to him was, you are like Gideon, afraid of the enemy, but God says, you are a mighty man of valor. You will have victory. And so that encouraged him to stay at his church and stand against the NPA that were coming in stronger into the province. And the end result was, the pastor didn't run away and hide. The NPA ran away and hid. Okay, but there was that struggle, and, we f and, and he could have failed, he could have run away and hid, and his ministry would have been discredited, and he might, might have moved up to Locos Norte, where nobody would know him and just become a farmer, but no, he rose up because, not that the Lord said, you are fair, but the Lord said, you are a man of victory, so God often will speak to us very positively. 
Jesus said to Peter, don't be afraid of your former sins. Now I will make you a fisher of men. And so, yes, we have failures in life. We can look and say, oh, I've done this wrong, I've done that. Oh, I'm dark, I'm black. But the beloved wants to say, you are fair. And lift us up out of our struggles and discouragements that we are part of the bride of Christ and our destiny is that we will have victory over the gates of hell and we will be part of the company of Christians that will be victorious and glorious. We will be a glorious bride for Christ. And so here the Lord starts to lift her up and speaks many different encouraging things in this book. And then... She's called, you are fair, my love, there in chapter 1. But let's look in Song of Solomon 4, verse 7. And after their months together, the relationship developing, and, and this young lady being more careful of herself to be beautiful in the sight of, of her suitor, the one that was visiting her again and again. It looked like it might become marriage. What did he say in Song of Solomon 4, 7? You are all fair, my love, and there is no spot in you. Okay, now back at the beginning, the beloved said, you are fair, my love. But he didn't say, you are all fair. Now he says, you are all fair, my love. There is no spot in you. There is no blemish. There is nothing wrong in you. Now, he couldn't say that at the beginning because she was, felt black. She felt embarrassed and that she was, you know, good for nothing. But the promise was you are fair. And now the Lord could say, now you are all fair. And there is no spot in you. That's what the Lord is going to be doing with the bride of Christ. He is preparing us to be a bride without spot or blemish. And so before King Solomon would marry this lady, he didn't marry someone that was fair. He married someone that had become all fair without a spot or wrinkle or blemish. And that is the bride Christ is preparing for his marriage. Let's read in Ephesians 5, verse 25 through 27. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So the bride that Christ is coming for has no spots, has no blemishes, will have nothing uh, wrong still in her life. And in chapter 4, after they had been developing their love relationship, after the Shulamite had been growing in God, the beloved was able to say, now you are all fair. There is no spot in you. And she was ready for marriage, just like Christ will marry a church without spot or wrinkle or blemish. Okay? So the bride's beauty increased as she learned to love Solomon better, as she was focusing in on their relationship and the possibility or probability of marriage that was to come. And just as a young woman that might have a fine young man that she's considering might become marriage, she will make herself pure. She will guard her heart 
to, uh, to focus in on that one, the best young man that, that, that in her heart she wants to marry. And, and she'll be careful with her hairstyle. Uh, she won't go out. Uh, she'll only you know, put on her makeup before she sees him. And she'll, she'll do her best to present herself as someone that is all beautiful that he would want to marry. And let's read about the marriage day, not of the Shulamite. Let's read about the marriage day of the church in Revelation chapter 19, when Christ returns from heaven and catches up the Christians so that we will be with the Lord forever. We read in verse 7 and 8, Revelation 19, at the second coming of Christ. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Okay, she was dressed in fine linen. Now, linen, when it's made, if it's not dyed, it's a pure white. And it is a very excellent material for cloth. Linen is different than most other materials for cloth, that linen breathes very easily. There's a passage of air through it. So someone wearing linen will have much less possibility of sweat. You go out on a hot day with a polyester shirt on, you're going to be dripping with sweat after a while. If you wear a linen garment, you will not sweat. And so in the Old Testament, the priests were told that they were to wear linen garments so that they would not sweat as they were serving in the house of God. Sweat speaking of, you know, of wrong smell, works of the flesh, that it's not hard to serve in the temple of God. If you've got linen garments, you won't sweat. Work will be easy. But it also says in Revelation 19 that the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. What prepares us to be clothed in white for the wedding of Christ and his bride? Our white garments are our righteous acts. As we learn to serve the Lord and live a righteous life, everything that we do that is righteous, when we love someone, when we serve for the church, when we keep ourselves from sin, we are weaving fine white linen garments. We are preparing that we will be without spot or blemish before the presence of the Lord. Because it's possible to be serving the Lord and still have sin in our lives, still have spots and blemish. Okay, let's read about someone, a high priest that had mixture and sin in their life in ministry. Let's read in Zechariah chapter 3, verse 1 through 4. Then he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan, standing at his right hand to oppose him. And the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord has chosen... Who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you? Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and was standing before the angel. And then he answered and spoke to those who stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, See, I have removed from iniquity from you, and I will clothe you with rich robes. So here was a high priest of Israel but he was ministering before the Lord with filthy garments, speaking of sin in his life. 
And there are times that ministers will act very spiritual at the pulpit, but they're wearing dirty garments. Their spirit has been defiled by the works of the flesh. They saw a bad Hollywood movie that was uh, R-rated and it, it put filth in their minds or, or they had some other problem and failed of the grace of God. So we can have garments spotted with the flesh, but Christ is preparing a bride that will not just be fair, but will be ready for marriage by being all fair with no spot or wrinkle. But be pure and have white garments on the pure righteous acts or righteous works or righteous ministry of the saints. So do we see how the bride goes from being fair to becoming all fair without spot? And through this greater purity in Song of Solomon chapter 4, she gets ready for her marriage in chapter 5. So there is a development, a changing testimony for this woman that becomes the bride of the son of David. And we want a maturing testimony. We want a transformed life where we don't walk around with spotted garments, with works of the flesh dirtying us, but where we are always walking in white and we are ready for the marriage of the Lamb. Okay, we're going to keep going on to see how she continues to develop, but why don't we have a 10-minute break? Okay, thanks. God bless you. Okay, as we're looking at the character of the bride of the son of David, speaking spiritually of the bride of Christ, we saw how she began with struggle in her heart, that she was fair but ugly, beautiful but marred, very dark of skin, because she'd worked hard for others, but she hadn't guarded her own heart. But that continues to develop. The beloved calls her fair, then calls her all fair. Now let's look, it's not in your notes, but let's look a little bit farther in Song of Solomon chapter 4. And let's read something about the character of the bride, again, in this, uh, in this figurative picture language. We read about the bride. Let's read, please, Song of Solomon, chapter 4, verse 12 through 15. Verse 12 from the Beloved. A garden enclosed is my sister, my spouse, a spring shut up, a fountain sealed. Your plants are on are an orchard of pomegranates, with pleasant fruits, fragrant hina with spikenard, spikenard and saffron, calamus and cinnamon, with all trees of frankincense, myrrh and aloes, with all the chief spices. A fountain of gardens, a well of living waters, and streams from Lebanon. So here, the bridegroom, Solomon, or for us figuratively, Christ describes something about the bride. It talks about how she is like an enclosed garden. That means a garden with a wall or a fence around it. And this garden is a very fruitful garden. And so we read here, starting in verse 13, about all of the different types of fruit and spices growing in the garden of the bride. And so it starts out in verse 13 saying, your plants are an orchard of. Then the first fruit mentioned is pomegranates. Now, if you come here to Antipolo, to ZMI, and go out towards our water reservoir, we have a pomegranate tree. 
and it presently has pomegranates growing on it. Have you seen the little round fruits with like the little crown on the bottom? Those are pomegranates. So she had in her garden pomegranates, number one, and pleasant fruits, but not specified any specific type. Pomegranates first specified, then, verse 13, fragrant henna with spike nard. So here are three things specifically identified growing. Pomegranates, henna, and spike nard. Then verse 14, spike nard is repeated, and number four, saffron. Then number five, calamus. Number six, cinnamon. With all the trees of seven, frankincense. Number eight, myrrh. Number nine, aloes. With all the chief spices, but not any by name. There are nine fruits and spices listed by name growing in the garden of the bride. And this, for us, should spiritually speak on how we are to have the nine fruit of the Spirit growing in the garden of our heart. Okay, mankind began in a garden. God told Adam and Eve to... Uh, to take care of the garden, let it be more and more beautiful as they learned to take care of it. It was their first thing they were to take care of, and a garden on the outside. But God is preparing that we will be the vineyard. We will be the garden that God wants fruitful things to grow in our heart. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, temperance, meekness, and so these are the fruit that is to grow in our garden. And so the bride had an enclosed garden. It was protected. Have any of you ever had a garden and your neighbor had a pig that got loose? That pig might go over to your garden and dig his nose all around and the next morning your garden is destroyed. If that has ever happened to you, if you were ever a farmer out in the province and you got your garden destroyed by a wandering pig, then I am sure it only happened once because you have built a fence or a wall around your garden. Well, there are evil spirits that want to attack our hearts. They want to shoot fiery darts and, and, and remind us of sinful things in the past, wrong things we have seen or we have done. And these fiery darts want to try to, uh, instead of having love in our heart, uh, maybe put lust. Instead of joy, maybe put anger. Instead of uh, peace, bring uh, uh, anxiety into our hearts. And there are the wild animals that want to destroy the fruit of the Spirit in our garden of our hearts, not the wild animals, but the evil spirits that want to attack us. But she was an enclosed garden. She was fruitful. And the bridegroom loved her. She was pure. <coughs> pure. She was fruitful. It was a joy. And then... The Shulamite says something in verse 16. Let's read that. The Shulamite. Awake, O oh, no, north wind, and come, O oh, south. Blow upon my garden, that its spices may flow out. Let my beloved come into his garden and eat its pleasant fruits. Okay. So the Shulamite, after the bride, groom, after her new husband, she's just newly married, is, uh, is praising her for the beautiful things in her heart. She says, Awake, O north wind, and come, O south. Blow upon my garden. Different winds and different seasons will mature fruit and spices. Some fruits develop the best in hot sunshine. There are a few fruits that grow the best in the darkness. 
There are some spices that will flourish in rainy environments. And there are other spices that need dry, hot deserts to make the perfume of the spice flow out. Different plants mature at different seasons and under different climates. And so here we have nine very different fruits and spices. And the Shulamite is saying, oh, let the north winds come, let the south winds come, let, let everything, let every experience come and blow into my garden. Now the north winds brought to Israel brought rain and colder times. They had a picture uh, maybe a week or two ago in some of the international news around the world of snow in Jerusalem. Now Jerusalem is pretty far south. It's not in the tropics, but it's near the tropics, and Jerusalem usually has a pretty warm climate. So for them to have snow was very unusual. I saw that picture. Uh, international news, snow in Jerusalem, okay? It came from the blowing of the north polar winds down south. For us, it's, we'll never get snow in the wintertime, but the Amihan, the northern winds, are cooler here in the Philippines. But it can be sometimes very cold and wet and rainy in Israel. And that's the opposite of when the south winds blow in Israel. South of Israel is the Negev Desert, the Sinai Peninsula. It's all desert. It's very hot and barren. And when the wind blows up from that, it's hot and it's dry. And so we can liken these opposite climates to opposite experiences in life. Sometimes the winds blow, the seasons spiritually come to us that are pleasant, and we get rain and refreshing, and it's cool, just like wintertime. It's cool, and, and we can enjoy, you know, the cooler weather. But when May comes around, we're all sweating bullets, right, when it's so hot out. And so we like the cool Amihan from the north coming in to the Philippines, but by May, in the summer, blazing sun, it's a different climate, and different things grow at different seasons. So the bride here is saying, let the good times come. Let the rains of refreshing come, and let the difficult dry seasons come. Let the hot and difficult experiences come, because everything in life can help form Christian character within us. How do you get the Christian character of long-suffering? Simply long. You suffer long, right? How can you get long-suffering? You've got to get suffering into your life. And when it's long, you learn long-suffering. And so there are some things that we learn through difficult seasons of life. There are some fruits that mature in the hot season. And there are other fruits that mature in the rainy, cooler season. There are some that ripen the best in bright sunlight. There are others that ripen the best in the darkness or the moonlight. And there are different experiences that come into our life that can grow and mature different areas of Christian character. So when the bridegroom, when the king said to this woman, oh, you're our enclosed protected garden. There's all of these beautiful, fragrant uh, fruits and spices in your garden. The Shulamite says, let the good times come, let the bad times, let, let, let all of the winds blow into my heart to mature the fruit and spices to be the joy 
of my beloved. And so then he says in chapter 5, verse 1, I have come into my garden, my sister, my spouse. I have gathered my myrrh with my spice. I have eaten my honeycomb with my honey. And here he is having intimate fellowship with her, eating of the fruit of her love, of the garden of her heart. That is the joy of the beloved. This is at the marriage time. This is when she had this prepared heart, these nine fruit of the Spirit, when she was all pure without spot and was ready for a fully intimate relationship with her beloved. As we can read here in picture language of this natural relationship Solomon developed with the Shulamite. Okay? Now, as the beauty of the bride increases until she's all fair with no spot, they get married. And as they go on, let's read Song of Solomon 6, verse 4. The beloved said, O oh my love, you are beautiful as Tirza, lovely as Jerusalem, awesome as an army with banners. So here, the beloved says to her, you're beautiful as Tirza. Tirza was a very beautiful city. It was a Samaritan city. It was a city that had been lived in by backsliders, by the Samaritans, the northern kingdom. But in the restoration of God, it's going to be, again, a beautiful city and lovely as Jerusalem and awesome as an army with banners. Now, banners for an army, different flags, speak of different companies or different groups in the army that have different weapons and have gone through different experiences of battle. On the banners, they can have symbols. And if in a natural army, it was the, uh, the brigade of the artillery, on their banner, they might have a cannon or an artillery on their banner. Another banner might have bow and arrows, for the archers, the, the company of the archers. And others might have on it uh, showing uh, some battles that they partook of that made them famous. And so the banners declare the, 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 the weapons and the victories of these different parts of the army. And so here... The, bride, the bridegroom is saying to his bride, not just that she's lovely, not just that she's married, but now she is like an army with victories and equipped for battle. Okay? When Jesus first said to his 12 disciples, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Well, in the natural, that looked ridiculous. Peter, the impulsive, will become a rock. Thomas, the doubter, will end up a victorious martyr in southern India. These men that were uneducated fishermen, how will they ever lead a movement that will grow to be the largest movement in world history? Right now, there are about 2 billion people that say they are Christians. And while, of course, they're not all born again or not all walking in the light, it is the largest group, largest religion, largest organization in the world. It is a mighty army that God is preparing. And there will be different banners. There will be victors that have gone through the persecution of Afghanistan. Or there will be the victors that evangelized 
uh, a so-and-so island and brought the people to Christ. And there will be the banner for the intercessors that kept not silence until God made the church a praise in all the earth. God is preparing us to be an army. And by chapter 6 of the Song of Solomon, she was no longer the ashamed country girl that felt defeated, that felt dark and black. Now, she was an awesome army with victories and banners. And when we read more about that, let's read in chapter 6, verse 13, about the Shulamite. Return, return, O Shulamite. Return, return, that we may look upon you. Keep going. What would you see, the Shulamite? What would you see in the Shulamite? As it were, the dance of the two camps. Okay, so here, the beloved, or we could say Christ, and his friends, it says, Come back, O Shulamite. Come back, we want to behold you. So she was at a distance. She was on, on some purposeful mission or something. And, they, and what would you see in the Shulamite? It is the dance of the two camps. What does this mean? A woman is two camps dancing around? Well, that word in the Hebrew for the two camps is Manahem. And we first find that in the Bible, back in the book of Genesis. Let's read Genesis 32, verse 1 and 2. So, so Jacob went on his way, and the angels of God sent, met him. When Jacob saw them, he said, the God, This is God's camp. And he called the name of that place Mahanem. Okay. Mahanem. The place of the two camps. That's what it means from the Hebrew. The double camp. The two camps. And what were the two camps? Jacob, his 12 sons, his wives, his servants, his flocks, his sheep, his goats. They were all on a journey back to the promised land. Jacob had gone up north to get married and and have his sons and, and multiply his flocks. And coming back, he was a, a small army. He was a camp full of people and flocks, thousands of sheep and goats, tens of thousands actually, probably. And then he came to a certain place where he saw the angels of God also. Now, Jacob was going back to where his father was, but he was also going back to where his brother Esau was. And the last time he had seen Esau, Esau wanted to kill him. And he was afraid about going back. But God encouraged him on the way. He had a camp with maybe about 40 or 50 people. And there was also another camp there. The angels were there. The scripture says, the angel of the Lord and camps around those who fear him. Jacob feared the Lord. He served the Lord. And the angels of the Lord camped around him. And so he saw he was not just going back to his father, his father's house, to his angry brother Esau, who might still want to kill him. He was not going back just with his earthly family. He had the angels of God going with him. And that was an encouragement that helped keep him going south. Oh, the angels of God are with me. And then later that night, he met the angel of the Lord that changed him and gave him a new name and prepared him for a victory. But the two camps refer to an earthly group of people and the hosts of angels above. Two camps. Now, 
in Genesis, it was the Old Testament people of God, Jacob and his family, and the angels that were the two camps. For the New Testament Christian, it is the Christians that are here, and it is the angels that are our second camp or second group. Do you remember the time when David was to fight the Philistines and God said, wait until you hear the sound of marching in the top of the trees. And when you hear the sound of marching in the top of the trees, then you send your soldiers forth and you will win the battle. But what kind of sound of marching do you hear in the top of trees? Birds marching? No. Insects flying around the top of the trees marching? No. It was the angels that God was sending at a certain time to march with David's army. And when David, with his army, fought, <coughs> excuse me, and with the army of the angels marching in before them, David gained a great victory. So when it says at this point that the Shunammite is an army awesome with banners, it also says that she is like having two camps. And it is the dance of two camps. If you have two people that are dancing, are they like 20 meters apart? No. When you have two people dancing... They're circling around each other. Maybe they're hand in hand or, or, or they're embracing each other. And when two people are dancing, they are close. They are intertwined. They are together. When the army of God on earth is with the army of the angels in the heavenlies, and together they are flowing together, they are dancing, they are working together, they are fighting together. That is what God is preparing for the bride of Christ, that we become like the Shulamite, that there are two camps, dancing, working, fighting together. Now, a few weeks ago, I was at a church, a church that has uh, one of the most wonderful churches that I know of for praise and worship uh, in the world. And God gave me a prophecy for the church that they were like uh, the dance of Mahanaim, that God was preparing them that in their worship, that it was not just going to be the worshipers on earth, but the double camp, the other camp, was going to be the angels worshiping with them, and together they would see mighty breakthroughs in God, spiritual victories, when the army of God is worshiping and is working with the angels of heaven. And that's what God wants to prepare us for, for worship where it's not just us, but where God's kingdom will come on earth as it is in heaven, where it is the church fighting with, as one group, one camp, and it is the angels of God come down that we will see the church of Jesus as a mighty army working with the angels of heaven having great breakthroughs in these last days. So, praise God, we want to prepare for the dance of Mahanaim as we grow close to the Lord and as the angels even desire to come down and be in our midst. Let's go on to see another description of this developing, maturing bride in chapter 7, verse 1. Can we read that, please? Let's look at that. The beloved said... How beautiful are your feet in sandals, O prince da princess daughter. The curves of your thighs are like jewels. The work of the hands of a skillful workman. Okay. So here the beloved begins to tell us seven beauties of the bride. He talks about her feet, 
talks about her curvy thighs. He talks about her navel, her belly button being so cute. And, uh, and then it gets even more R-rated than that. So we won't read it all, okay? But seven in the Bible is a number of uh, fullness or perfection. And here we see the bridegroom, or spiritually Christ, praising his bride for the fullness of beauty. And the first thing he says in chapter 7, verse 1, is how beautiful are your feet in sandals, O prince's daughter. She is of royalty now, and she has beautiful sandals. What do sandals speak of in the Bible? Let's read in Isaiah. Does anybody remember where that is? Isaiah chapter, what is it, 60 or 61? How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those that... Does anybody know where that is in Isaiah? I'm sorry, I don't have that scripture prepared. Anyone? 52? Okay. Let's read. Okay, yes, thank you. Isaiah 52, verse 7. Can you read that, please? How, be how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who proclaims peace, who brings glad tidings of good things, who proclaims salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. So here... We see the beautiful feet of those that are traveling and preaching and declaring to the people of God of the Lordship of Christ, that our God reigns. And so here, she is being praised as being ready to travel. In Ephesians 6, we have that we need to have our feet firmly shod with the preparation of the gospel, that we can be soldiers marching with protected feet. In the natural, a soldier is protected by his boots or with the Roman soldier's thick leather sandals. But in the spirit, we are prepared when we are ready to go as messengers of the gospel. And so, when she started, the future bride said, well, I take care of the vineyards, but I haven't taken care of my own. I'm, I, I have a darkened uh, life, and I'm ashamed, and I haven't really done everything well. But now, her beloved is saying, you have become a victorious army. You are ready. Your feet are ready to go forth and preach and spread the gospel. And then going on a little farther in chapter 8, Well, well, we'll try to get into that in a little bit, where she talks about how she's fully mature. But let's go on and look at chapter 7, verse 12. Or let's, how about 11 and 12? Song of Solomon 7, verse 11 and 12. This is the Shulamite, the, the bride speaking to her beloved. Verse 11. Come, my beloved, let us go forth to the field. Let us lodge the, in the villages. Let us get up early to the vineyards. Let us see if the vine has budded, whether the grape blossoms are open and, and the pomegranates are in bloom. There I will give you my love. So here... Solomon's bride, or the bride of Christ, is saying, come, let us both together go to the field, go out to the villages, look at the vineyards, and see if the grapes are maturing, if the pomegranates are growing. 
There I will give you my love, the bride says to her beloved. Now remember, at the beginning of the Song of Solomon, she said, oh, I've worked in the vineyard so hard, uh, but my beloved was not there. And I got burned. The sun made me black. I'm so ashamed. I've had a difficult experience out there. My brothers were, uh, were so bossy. They were the dictators that made me work so hard. And, and, and they were, and I, I'm black. That was her first experience out in the vineyards. It made her ashamed to even see the, her future her future bridegroom. But now she is saying to the king, let us both go into the field, into the villages, to the vineyards to see if it's bringing forth fruit. This is the bride of Christ saying to Christ, let's both go together into the field. The field is the world. Let's go to the villages. Let's go to the, to, the, uh, to the extension churches and the pioneer works out in the sitios. Let's go to the vineyards and see uh, in, the, in the Bible study groups if, if some people are growing fruitful in the Lord. And there, as we go together in our ministry outreach, in our going to the little places and the other vineyards, there I will give you my love. Before the Shulamite was working hard in the vineyard and it made her feel farther away from her future love, made her ashamed and retreating, embarrassed, but now, with confidence, she can say, let's both go together in the ministry. Let's both go to the Bible, uh, uh, you know, home fellowship group. Let's both go to this pioneer work. I'm not going alone. You're going with me. And as I'm serving you, there we will share our love. Now, there are times when we're in ministry, and in the middle of the ministry, the ministry is drawing us closer to the heart of God. That's what God wants, that in our ministry, we feel the heart of God, we share the heart of God. But if we're especially younger in the ministry, and we're working overly hard. We're trying to prove we can do so much for the Lord. And, and everything the pastor asks, yes, I'll do it. Yes, I'll do it. What? No money. Okay, I'll walk. Okay, no Marianda. Okay, I'll fast. Okay. We try so hard, but it makes us feel farther away from God. Do you ever feel you work so hard to do something for the church or for the Lord and you don't feel your heart is closer to God. You feel farther away. Ah, oh, I just haven't prayed. Ah, oh, I just haven't. Oh, that ever happened to you? I've got, you know, I got one foot and two hands up. Oh, I know what that's all about. When we work so hard, but it, we end up getting filled with pride, or we end up getting filled with exhaustion, or we end up getting filled with feeling black and ugly and embarrassed instead of being closer to God. But by the end of the Song of Solomon, she was ready for ministry with her beloved, sharing and finding that in that ministry, that was where they would give each other their love. That's what we want to develop into. Amen? that our ministries encourage our love relationship with the Lord, not distract us or make us so busy that we forget our prayers or we forget our own Bible reading. We forget to rest in the Lord. So by this point, she had on beautiful sandals. Her feet were shod with the preparation of the gospel. She was not going to burn out 
as a Christian worker trying so hard, like in chapter 1. Now she was ready to not burn out. She was ready to burn with love, working together with Christ. That is what the ministry should become all about, that we work with Christ, share his heart, and share his love. And then let's read in chapter 8, verse 12. Chapter 8, verse 12. To Solomon. My own vineyard is before me. You, O Solomon, may have a thousand, and those who tend its fruit, two hundred. So here the bride is saying to her beloved, my own vineyard is before me. You, O Solomon, my king, my husband, my love, I will be able to give you a thousand pieces of silver, the produce of my vineyard. It's very fruitful. I can, I can give you a, a, a gracious offering from what I have earned. And those that tend the fruit, the vineyard keepers that she was employing, could generously have 200 pieces of silver as the reward for their work. Now remember at the beginning of the Song of Solomon, she was the helper in the vineyard, and it was her brothers that owned it, made her work hard, and they probably kept most of the money. But now she has her vineyard that is fruitful. She isn't neglecting it. Her own vineyard is very fruitful and can be a great blessing to her beloved. And she is generously supporting workers under her. She's no longer a church worker. She is the boss. She's the senior pastora. And she has workers under her and she is paying them well with a generous heart. She's a blessing to her beloved and a blessing to the whole church. So there is a transformation in her character. There is also a transformation in her ministry as we see this book develop. Okay? And this is what the Song of Solomon is all about, a growing love relationship that develops into a mature, loving ministry that's deeper and deeper. Okay? Now, also in your notes, we have a maturing Christian will have changing experiences with the ministry, and with other ministers. Okay, as you grow in God, you're going to have a lot of different relationships or contact with different ministers. Maybe you're a Christian worker now, and your pastor is the main boss that, uh, that you serve the church under, or maybe you have an uh, assistant pastor that you work for, or maybe you're part of the, ministry, the worship team, and maybe uh, it's the music director that guides most of your works. But you will face a lot of working together with different ministries. Sometimes they will be over you. As you grow in God, the time will come when you will be over them, when you will become a senior leader. But let's look at some of the experiences the bride had as she was growing and maturing. Okay, let's start with the first one. Back in Song of Solomon 1 6, we read that, but let's look at the foundation again when she was just starting to know the king. Chapter 1, verse 6. Do not look upon me because I am dark, because the sun has tanned me. My mother's sons were angry with me. They made me the keeper of their vineyards, but my own vineyard I have not kept. Okay. The mother 
speaks of the church. And the sons, they are the ones that own the vineyard or they take care of it. They're the, the ministers. And she was a worker under them, a Christian worker. But the mother's sons, the leaders, they weren't very kind to her. They were dictators over her, telling her, do this, do that. Work more. You got to work more. Don't come home before sundown. And there are times that Christian workers, when they're young in the ministry, they will be bossed around by people that are not always kind. You did that again? You do that one more time, I'm giving you a DA. Three months, okay? There are times that it's difficult being a Christian worker because if you didn't notice yet, your pastor and the leaders of your church are not yet perfect. Did you all notice that? You'll have abundant opportunity to see it. Yes, we're imperfect people. And so here we see that they were not careful to help this young woman to take care of the garden of her own heart, of her own vineyard. And they bossed her around. Now, that was difficult, okay? She was pressured into doing more and more, but she really couldn't handle it well. And there are times you will be told to do things that aren't even what God wants. It's just leaders by their own choosing. They say, okay, I want you to be in charge of that. And you might say, well, pastor, I, I just don't feel called to that ministry. And he says, well, you're called now. I'm calling you. Do it. Okay. And maybe it isn't the will of God, but it's the will of the leaders. And when you're just a follower, you either have to follow or you're going to be DA'd out of the ministry, okay? So these things happen. You don't have to raise your hands. It's happened to some of you, okay? Happened to me. Now, from that, when she first saw the beloved, she said, I'm black but lovely. I, I, I'm like the black tents of, of Kedar, of the, of the carnal people, the Ishmaelites, but I'm also like the beautiful curtains in Solomon's temple, honoring God. I've got this struggle. I've got this mixture. And so let's read verse 7. What does she do with this mixture? Tell me, O oh you whom I love, where, where you feed your flock where you make it rest at noon. For why should I be as one who veils herself by the flocks of your companions? So she meets the beloved. Maybe King Solomon was out uh, inspecting his uh, thousands of sheep in that area of the country. But she said, uh, tell me, where do you feed your flock? Where do your sheep rest? For why should I be like one that veils herself, uh, that in modesty covers herself, her covers her face, and I am just by the flocks of your companions? She was saying, I don't want to just have a veiled face uh, by the companions. The New Testament tells us that we, with unveiled faces, are to be able to see the glory of God in the face of Christ. But some people have to wear veils. If you're in a Muslim country, you might have to wear complete dark garments and a veil. Okay? Very difficult garments to wear. But she said, why should I just be veiled and, and, just, be, and just know where your companions are? Beloved, where do you rest? Where do your sheep find peace? She wanted not just to be with the keepers of the, uh, the ones that owned the vineyard, her brothers. She didn't just want to 
know the companion shepherds. She wanted to know the great shepherd. And so Solomon, in charge of all the sheep, he was the great owner of all the sheep at that time. She said to him, where can I be with your sheep? How can I be close to you and know your rest? And then what did Solomon answer to her in verse 8? The beloved said, If you do not know, O fairest among women, follow in the footsteps of the flock and feed your little goats beside the shepherd's tents. She says, Where do you dwell, Lord? How can I be close to you? He replies back, If you don't know, then follow near the shepherd's tents. The other shepherds will help you to get closer to me, to know me more. If you don't personally know how to get closer to me, ask the pastors, ask your elders. They might have a key for something to unlock in your life, a struggle, a difficulty, a depression that is keeping you from getting closer to the Lord. So here, the beloved doesn't say, oh, I will teach you myself. No, he says, if you are young, immature, uh, uh, afraid, go to the shepherd's tents. Let the ministers help you. They can help a young Christian like you. So that's the first time we read about the ministers here, the flocks of sheep guided by not King Solomon, but by his companions, by the other shepherds. She was to go to the lesser shepherds, and they would be able to help her. But that did not remain the case forever. Let's read another time that she went for help for the ministry in chapter 3. Let's read verse 1 through 3. The Shulamite, by night on my bed, I sought the one I love. I sought him, but I did not find him. I will rise now, I said, and go about the city. In the streets and in the squares, I will seek the one I love. I sought him, but I did not find him. The watchmen who go about the city found me. I said, have you seen the one I love? Verse 4. Scarcely had I passed by them when I found the one I love. I held him and would not let him go until I had brought him to the house of my mother and into the chamber of her who conceived me. So here is the Shulamite. Night after night, she sought the one that she loved. Spiritually speaking, we often will toss and turn on our bed. We're seeking for the presence of the Lord. You're praying, Lord, when will you come to me? Lord, I haven't felt your presence for days. Lord, I, I've, I've got this struggle. Uh, I'm seeking you, but I'm not finding you. Verse 2, she said, I can't find him myself in my nightly devotions. I will go about the city and the streets and seek him. She sought him in Prosperity Highway. And she did not find the Lord. She looked for him on the praise street, but somehow she just couldn't connect. She went and tried all around the city. That's Jerusalem, the city of God, speaking of the church. And she went to these different churches, and she just could not connect with the Lord. But then, verse 3, the watchman of the city found her. And she said, have you seen the love, the one I love? Here, she meets the watchmen, the leaders. Watchmen in the scriptures from Ezekiel, I think chapter 3, talk about the servants of the Lord. And the watchmen, or the pastors, uh, that are keeping watch over the people of God, 
She's searching through the church to find Christ. She meets some ministers and says, uh, I, I can't meet the Lord. I, uh, my devotions, they're empty. I try to meet with him night by night. I, I just can't find the Lord. She says, do you know where he is? What's wrong with my spiritual life? Verse 4, she said, scarcely had I passed by them when I found the one I love. So when she went to the watchman and said, do you know where my beloved is? They probably said, oh, he's right over here. Just, you know, just turn over to this one street, turn one corner. He's right over there. This is where you'll find your love. She probably got help from the watchman. Or else, just going past them, then she found her beloved. But it would appear that they helped her to find him. And she said, I will not let him go until I bring her into the house of my mother, into the chamber of her who conceived me. Now, spiritually speaking, this can mean that the bride wanted to bring the bridegroom back to where she was conceived. And in the Bible, when we are conceived and given life, we are conceived, we are birthed with a sinful Adamic nature. And here, the future bride of Christ, this, this one that is being prepared for much greater things, she's saying, oh, I need to find the Lord. I need to bring him back to the, to, the, to, to the very beginnings of my life. I need to have sin cut off at its roots. I need to bring him back to where I was conceived, conceived with the sin of Adam, and let Christ crucified cut off these sins. And so here she's seeking the Lord, and the watchman seemingly helped point her to right where she finds the Lord. But as she goes on into deeper experiences with God, she becomes like an army. She gains her sandals. Let's read what happened the next time she went and tried to find her love. Let's read chapter 5, verse 2 through 6. The Shulamite. I sleep, but my heart is awake. It is the voice of my beloved. He knocks, saying, Open for me, my sister, my love, my dove, my perfect one, for my head is covered with dew, my locks with the drops of the night. I have taken off my robe. How can I put it one on again? I have washed my feet. How can I defile them? My beloved put his hand by the latch of the door, and my heart yearned for him. I arose to open for my beloved, and my hands dripped with mirror, my fingers with liquid mirror, and the handles of the lock. I opened for my beloved, but my beloved had turned away and was gone. My heart leaped up when he spoke. I sought him, but I could not find him. I called him, but he gave me no answer. Okay. Here the beloved. Again, it's a night season. And she says she sleeps, but her heart is awake. She was seeking the Lord in a dark time of life. Or maybe it can speak of, of our devotions in the evening or in the, uh, a dark season of our soul. And she says, my heart is awake, and I hear the voice of my beloved. He's saying, open your heart, my love. My head is covered with dew. My locks drip with the drops of the night. He was coming in in the nighttime with dew upon him, with refreshing. He wants to come and refresh her and, and share his love. And what is her response? Verse 3. But I've taken off my robe. I've got my nightgown on. I'm not ready to open the door and receive a visitor. I've washed my feet 
If I get out of bed, I'm going to get my feet dirty again. She didn't want to crawl out of bed and welcome her visitor. She was tired. She was sleeping. Have you ever woken up and felt a stirring in your heart? Or maybe you had a dream that just encouraged you somehow to seek the Lord. And you wake up and you go, oh, oh, why am I awake? Oh, I, I think I should seek the Lord, but, you know, I'm so tired. Uh, you know, I got ready for bed and it's late at night and I don't have time for devotions. I am so sleepy. I, I think the Lord wants to meet with me, but, oh, are any of us slow to respond when sometimes the Spirit of God encourages us, stop what you're doing, just find a place alone, it, just, just pray, just worship your God. Do we ever feel the Spirit of God? Do we ever feel like we should stop what we're doing or in the evening, stop, you've got time to pray before you sleep, and then sometimes we don't, sometimes we're too busy, or we're too tired. And so she was slow in responding to her beloved. And when finally she did rise up to open, she heard his, his hand on the latch, the outside of the door, tried to open the door, but it, but it was locked. She said, oh, he's right here. He stands at the door and knocks. Oh, my beloved, he wants to come in. And, and so finally she got out of bed and rose to open and as she uh, went to the, the door handle, her fingers dripped with myrrh, fragrance. She just felt the anointing. Oh, oh, I can meet with God. And she opened the door. And the Lord had already left. She was slow in responding to his invitation for love. And so he left. There are times when the Lord wants to teach us to quickly respond to his spirit, when he wants to draw us into a time of prayer or it's time to worship, it's time to set aside a day and fast or it's time to, to, to just seek the Lord. And sometimes we're slow in responding. And then when we do respond, sometimes it's too late. Remember when the Israelites at Kadesh Barnea, the Lord told them, go up today and fight and go in and conquer your inheritance? They said, we can't do it. The, there's, the giants are too big and the armies are, we can't go fight. And so they disobeyed the Lord and the Lord said, okay, you'll wander in the wilderness for 38 years until all the adults are dead and your children will have faith to go in. Then the Israelites the next day, the soldiers put on their armor and said, we're sorry, we're disobeyed. We're ready to go up and fight today. Do you remember that story? Acts chapter, I mean, uh, Numbers chapter 14, I think. And the Lord, and Moses said, don't go up and fight. God is not with you today. You had your window of opportunity. You had your day. Behold, now is the day. Now is the acceptable time. And if we don't respond in God's time, sometimes we miss what God wants to do. Jesus wept over Jerusalem and said, Oh, if you had only known the day of your visitation, if you had only known that this is the day your king is coming, you could have revival. You've missed your opportunity. Behold, your city is going to be made desolate. The Roman armies are going to come and encircle you. And there won't be one stone left upon another at the glorious temple. It's all going to be destroyed because they did not respond to God in their day, the day that they could have had revival and met the Lord. So here she was slow and not fully obedient. And then when she opened the door, he was already gone. So what happened? Verse 6, she said, I sought him. I could not find him. I called. He gave me no answer. My beloved, can you hear me? Are you still near? Come back. Where are you? And 
He didn't come. So she went out to search for him again. Like the time, <coughs> excuse me, before, when she by night had sought her love and couldn't find him. And so she went out around the city, chapter 3. And when she found the watchman and said, have you seen the one I love? They were able to help guide her to meet, to find her love. But now she's going about the city trying to find where her love is gone. And she meets the watchman again. Let's read what the watchmen do this time in chapter 5, verse 7. The watchmen who went about the city found me. They struck me. They wounded me. The keepers of the wall took my veil away from me. Okay, the first time the watchmen helped her. This time, she goes to meet with the Lord and asks for their help. They don't help her. They strike her. They wound her. They slap her face. They say, go on home. You crazy woman, you're up in the middle of the night wandering the streets of Jerusalem. Are you a prostitute? You're not a good girl. You get out of here. They struck her. And it says, they took my veil away from me. Because women who went around at night without a veil were the prostitutes. Okay? So they took away her veil, thinking she was wandering the streets at night as an evil woman when she was trying in the darkness of her soul in her struggle to find her beloved. And she thought, the watchman can help me. They, they, they know where the people are. They, they know where my beloved is. They can help. They didn't help her. Instead, they took away her veil. They accused her of all kinds of, of, of wrong things. And they struck her. And sent her away. This time, the ministry didn't help her. Back in chapter 1, the Lord said, Go to my companion shepherds, and they will help you to know how to find my rest. Then in chapter 3, she found the watchman and had just gone past them when she met the beloved. But now she finds the watchman and asks for their help. And instead of helping, the accuser of all kinds of wrong things take away her veil and beat her and send her away in shame. There are times when Christian ministry will help us, but there are also times when we can be misunderstood by Christian ministers. And people will say wrong things about us when we don't deserve it. They will shame us. They will accuse you of doing something wrong when you didn't do it at all. And instead of helping you to find the Lord, they will shame you. They'll tell the church, we're giving a DA to so-and-so. And so-and-so -so didn't do anything wrong. The leader just thought they did something wrong, had a wrong attitude in their own heart, punished the Christian worker, said they did wrong. And oh, how hard that can be. Joseph, when he told his brothers about his dreams, that he would rule, they didn't like what he did, what he said, what he was going to be. They said, we'll stop his stupid dreams. He'll never rule over us. We'll kill him. And then later they decided, no, he is our brother. We won't kill him. We'll just send him away as a slave far away. He'll never have his dreams to, for us to serve him. But he was accused of wrong things, wrong attitudes. You silly dreamer. There are times you might go up to a minister and say, God has called me to be a pastor. And they'll say, what? You? You be a pastor? <laughs> you, you aren't pastor material. Or they'll say, what? 
you're a lady. Don't you know pastors are men? Right? There are times that the watchman won't help you. Instead, they'll strike you. They'll say something wrong about you. They'll misunderstand you. And they won't understand how God is leading you into a deeper walk with him. Because sometimes God wants to lead you into deeper experience, experiences in God than what some pastors and leaders have experienced. And if you try to tell them about a deeper experience, they'll say, uh, you know, you're kind of weird. What do you mean? You saw an angel. I think you're just dreaming it up. I think you're just proud and making up the story so everybody will think you're so spiritual. You didn't see an angel. I don't see angels. You don't see angels. And so there are times that instead of being encouraged, a younger Christian can be discouraged. And God can allow it to work something deeper within your heart. Joseph suffered so that he could learn mercy and forgiveness. Jesus suffered and he said, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. Paul said that we are to experience the fellowship of his suffering. Jesus was accused wrongly of evil and there was no evil in him. There are times people will misunderstand you. They'll misunderstand how you're really trying to seek the Lord, how you're really trying to please the Lord. And they'll say, knock it off. You're not any more spiritual. You're not going to become a pastora. We don't believe in pastoras in, in our organization. Or uh, there will be th ways in which you'll be discouraged. When I was in my last year, I went to a three-year Bible school, in the uh, first school I studied at. Then uh, in my third year, I had a burden of intercession come upon me one night with my roommate, who was a man of the Spirit. Within two years after graduation, he had raised up from zero a church of 500 people. But we had spiritual experiences at Bible school as we prayed together and worshiped. And this one time, I had such a burden. I wasn't in my dormitory, because I think you've heard the stories how the walls of the dormitory are thin, right? Lord, what should I do? Go to Africa. Remember that story? The walls were thin. I didn't want to disturb everybody in the rooms, the dorm rooms. So I went to the end of the hall to a storage room. So my, uh, my roommate and I were in the storage room, and in the storage room there were a lot of mattresses. So I was weeping before the Lord, praying, groaning, oh, oh, and I was lying down on the, map, on the mattress, and he was sitting there next to me, I think on a seat, and we were praying because we both knew there was a, a principality of Satan that was attacking a church that we both knew. And God had led us in the spirit to be groaning in travail for a breakthrough for that church. So uh, I was groaning with the burden of the spirit. Uh, like in Romans 8, 26, the spirit groans with groanings that it cannot be uttered, cannot be vocally expressed, just like a woman in travail. Oh, oh, oh. And there was my roommate, my friend, my prayer partner, he was laying hands on me and he was rebuking Satan. We were rebuking that fallen angel. We were rebuking that darkness. Well, I was noisy, but we went to the end of the hall. We tried to be, you know, not disturb the, uh, the dormitory. But after 30 or 40 minutes of very, very intense prayer, weeping, groaning in travail, and, 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 and fighting the devil. Finally, the burden lifted, and I lifted up my head to 
see my friend Gary, and you know, we could talk about this spiritual warfare. And when I looked at him, I looked more, and I saw all around us in this room were all of my different dorm mates, all the other brothers in the dorm. They had heard my groaning, or they heard about this, and they all came, and they circled around, and they watched uh, my friend and I while we had our spiritual travail, our uh, uh, fighting the devil. And, you know, I wasn't that noisy. We were at the end of the hall. I didn't think it. I woke everybody up, but I didn't know why they were all standing around. You know, didn't they ever weep and travail in prayer? And, and so we just said good night to them and walked back to our dorm and slept. Well, the next morning and the next day and the day after that and the day after that, there were about 300 people in our Bible school. I started having people look at me and look at me with a little bit of fear in their eyes. They were drawing back. They were <laughs> chismus, chismus, chismus. They were saying things. And, 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 and they, were, they were looking at me different than before. And I had people that I had been friends with. I was trying to encourage the younger two years of students to really be spiritual and seek the Lord. And I would try to tell them spiritual, and they'd shut up, and they'd you know, kind of stop the conversation and go away. And I didn't understand, why are all of my former friends, why do they have a wall up? Why are they not, you know, friends like before? And, and why are they whispering? And it wasn't until after I graduated that I figured out, when the men in the dorm saw my roommate laying hands on me and rebuking the devil, and there I was, oh, oh, oh they thought he was casting demons out of me. And so the gossip spread all through the Bible school that Brother Norman has had demons and they were cast out of him last night by Gary Lazardo. Okay? Ay, ay, ay. How would you like to be groaning in the spirit with the burden of the Holy Spirit and someone comes up and says, you have a demon, Right? Or how would you like to be part of a church that didn't believe in Pentecost? And you're praying and you get baptized in the Spirit, you speak in tongues, and your pastor comes up to you and says, you know, I don't know how it happened, but you've gotten demon-possessed. When you speak in tongues, that's the devil. Have any of you ever done anything in the purity of your heart by the leadership of the Holy Spirit, and you have been misunderstood by other Christian leaders? Has that ever happened to you? Raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay. Okay, maybe about a third of you. Okay, well, let me encourage the other two-thirds. It can still come, okay? you can still have the blessing of being misunderstood. And with Joseph and with the Apostle Paul and with many others, have the fellowship of his suffering, of being misunderstood. Now, sometimes we think we're being spiritual and we're not. It's just flaky and we'll say, well, God just called me to be the last great apostle of the last days. Bless God. You know, and uh, maybe you're not called to be an apostle anyhow. You misunderstood it. So there are times people are super spiritual and it's not from the Holy Spirit. In that case, someone needs to put them aside and say, uh, brother, uh, I, you know, I have a prophetic ministry. I don't feel you are called to the ministry of a prophet. So don't go around and tell everyone you're a prophet. Maybe in future years you will grow and develop into that. I don't have the witness in my spirit. Just don't wear a tag at ministers' gatherings. Prophet so-and-so. 
I've seen people do that. They don't want to be pastor so-and-so. They go to a, a ministry gathering. And they want prophet so-and-so or apostle or bishop. Mm. And sometimes it's not from God. So we don't want to, you know, blow our own horn or think that we're super spiritual when we're not there yet. But God wants to lead us on into deeper spiritual experiences and there will be times you will experience things from God that other people, even other ministers, will not understand. And the keepers of the walls, the ones that are to guard the people of God, instead of helping you, take away your veil, your reputation, they gossip against you. And say, so you know that pastor that prophesies all the time? Uh, he, he's just flaky. He's, he's a wacko. He's just out of it. He, he's not really spiritual. He just looks spiritual. And, and you're prophesying by the Holy Spirit. Or maybe you're really in a season of, of prophecy, and the pastor says, you stop that. I don't prophesy. You don't prophesy. Sometimes spiritual giftings are not appreciated because someone is jealous. There can be all kinds of reasons why ministers can misunderstand and at times accuse you of wrong when you're not doing wrong. God is leading you by his spirit. But balance that out. If you're a young Christian, if you're uh, just, you know, a Christian worker, don't just think, well, my pastor, he's really carnal. He just doesn't understand how sp super spiritual I am. Maybe he's right and you're wrong. So be careful of that. But this bride in the Song of Solomon, she was sometimes helped by the ministers. Sometimes she was misunderstood as she went deeper and deeper in God. So I would encourage you to read the Song of Solomon and seek for a spiritual perspective of how the bride, the beloved, is to teach us things about the bride of Christ and about your growing love relationship with the Lord and your relationship with other ministers or other friends in the body of Christ. How Christ is going to draw you near to him, or at times will leave you alone for you to need to seek him in a greater way. The Song of Solomon teaches us lessons of love, lessons of growing in God. And I would encourage you to read the book, study it. Also, Pastor Brian Bailey has an excellent book called The Bride. You can download it from our website for free. I would encourage if you want to study the Song of Solomon more fully, uh, just download his book. It's free, called The Bride. And the first four-fifths of the book go verse by verse through the Song of Solomon. And you will learn many valuable truths in that book. We only have had time for an overview, but I hope it gives you a foundation to understand the book from a spiritual level and that it can help guide you through future experiences of growing in God.